Hello and welcome to this episode of CITV. Today we're joined by Dr. David Clark. Dr. Clark, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Perfect. All right. Today we're doing a video case review and the topic is peripheral neuropathy. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, sure. You have a case. Uh, I know peripheral neuropathy can... Su- oh, really? This, hey, this yeah. is a bonus. I know peripheral yeah. neuropathy sometimes can be easy, but sometimes it can be complex. Uh, so there's a spectrum to it and you're going to kind of show us about that. So um, I'm eager to get started. Are you ready? I am indeed. Let me get right, started right let's... here. Okay. Ready when you are. Let's do it. Oh, there it is. Okie dokie. Uh, let's get it. So we're going to be talking about using two things. Now, in the past, I've done some um, you know, case reviews using primarily the clinical neurochemistry, but these couple cases are using both neurochemistry and what we'll call the clinical neuroscience receptor-based rehab sort of approach to address a couple people that have peripheral neuropathy. So I'll make sure I got this new interface working right. And there it is. So if we just talk about neuropathic symptoms in general, here's the questions we got to ask. Is it metabolic, right? Is it the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerve that's causing the symptoms? Or is it both? And the answers that you give to those questions are obviously are what are going to determine the treatment. So being able to answer those questions correctly and effectively and efficiently, that is the total key to being able to handle a case of peripheral neuropathy. Now, I've noticed that this new, this new uh, system here is not letting me go bullet by bullet, so I'm going to be kind of uh, apparently stealing my thunder. So there's going to be some punchlines and things that you guys are going to know. So let's just start with uh, Gwen. Uh, Gwen is 67. She's got numbness in both her feet. She's got tingling in both of her feet. She has a sensation of tension and tightness in both of her feet. She has burning, sharp pain from her feet up to her hips. And the big problem with this for her on, on a daily basis is that she has trouble sleeping at night due to those symptoms. She wakes up several times at night with those symptoms. So let's just start with that, right? Let's just start with this. So where do you start with a case like this? Do you just go ahead and just and run in and start doing some kind of receptor-based rehab? Uh, do you do some kind of neurochemical metabolic intervention? Do you put her on some kind of diet? Well, here's what I always do. I always look at these symptoms and I kind of put on my you know decoder ring and my x-ray glasses and I think, look, let's interpret these symptoms looking at two sets of factors. The first set of factors would be these metabolic causes, right? Um, so If we think about metabolic causes for these symptoms that Gwen has, what could they be? Uh, Well, number one, if you look over there on the far left, uh, it could be diabetes. Yep, diabetes is by far the most common cause of, you know, polyneuropathies. Uh, Could it be a B12 problem? Sure, B12 deficiency will definitely cause uh, neuropathies. Also causes some kind of, uh, sometimes a cord-based neuropathies like subacute combined degeneration. Could it be a folate problem? Yep, for the same reason, because B12 and folate are both necessary cofactors for making myelin and a bunch of other things. Uh, could it be an autoimmune cause for her neuropathy? Yeah, possibly at this point. Yeah, it could be that. I'll just tell you that based on the just that pattern of numbness in both feet, tingling in both feet, I'm already leaning kind of away from the autoimmune-mediated uh, neuropathy. Now, that's just my first pass at her symptoms. I haven't given you guys history or exam findings, but already looking at those symptoms, if I have the knowledge of what those symptoms could mean walking into the case, makes me have a much easier job determining you know, what way should I be going. Now, if we look at the other set of factors, which I call like you know the, the neuraxis factors or the circuit factors, what could it be? Well, a neuropathy could be caused by compression. Right, like you can have a compression that is from like a disc herniation or stenosis. Uh, you could have a peripheral nerve entrapment. Right, you could have she could have like a, a bilateral peroneal nerve uh, kind of entrapment. Not super likely, but she but it's possible. We'd have to examine her and find out. Uh, could she have demyelination? Well, yeah, demyelination is really a metabolic problem. But could she have that? I mean, it's possible, but if you know anything about demyelination, it's probably not going to present with the kind of symmetrical uh, symptoms in just the lower extremity. So we're kind of toss that to the side. We'll talk more about how to determine this. Could it be, you know, a thalamic problem? Yeah, but, you know, thalamus problems typically are going to be kind of hemi uh, distributions. They're not really going to be both uh, extremities at one time. 
Could it be parietal lobe? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's where your somatosensory map is. It's got a, you know, the right side has a representation of both sides. The left side has a representation of the right side. And sure, I mean, because that's where you're going to be processing uh, somatosensory signals. And if you have a distortion in how that parietal lobe is functioning, one of the things that is common is you get paresthesias. So yeah, that's, th these are all definitely things. Now, the reason I go through it right now with you is because this is what I do when I read this lady's history. I go, okay, these are her symptoms. What are metabolic possibilities that could explain that? What are you know, neuraxis, uh, you know, brain possibilities that would explain those symptoms? All right, so I hope that makes sense. So here's kind of the history of the symptoms. So she had a slow onset of those symptoms that we we're mentioning, you know, the numbing and tingling over the last few years. So it started with the numbness, and then it progressed to tingling, the tightness, and then the actual pain. So that's the progression of symptoms. Now the tempo of it is fairly gradual over a couple of years. So it's not like she woke up one morning and she had it. Uh, it came on, you know, episodically. It's sort of a slow, insidious onset. And with the anatomical distri distribution of it, it started with the feet and then progressed proximally up the lower leg and the thigh. So look, if you know anything about neuropathies at all, you're probably thinking, that sounds a lot like a diabetic neuropathy. And yeah, I'm with you, a symmetric kind of uh, sensory neuropathy. It's not motor, really. It sounds a lot like it'd be a, a diabetic polyneuropathy. Oops, wrong thing. So let's look at it another way, okay? So on those metabolic causes, you know, could it be diabetes? Sure. Puzzle piece means yet to be determined, right? Could it be B12 deficiency? Yeah, to be determined. That still makes sense based on her symptoms. Folate? Yeah, it could be. Autoimmune, yeah, it could be, but you know, I'm kind of halfway between the puzzle piece and the red X on that one. Now, in terms of the other factors, the kind of strictly neuraxis factors, could it be compression? Well, I can't really think of a compression that's going to cause bilateral progressive loss, uh, and, and those. I, I just can't think of one that would do that, especially not with the tempo of the, of the symptoms. What about demyelination? Not really. That's not you know slow and insidious like that. Those usually tend to happen uh, more acutely. And by the way, this type of thing that I'm doing here, this is the exact type of thought process I'm going to be teaching when we do that uh, peripheral neuropathy class that we're doing in December. I'm going to be going through exactly how to use the person's symptoms to kind of divine and interpret, you know, what are the, the most likely probabilities. Because you've got to be able to do this efficiently, you've got to be able to do it uh, quickly, you've got to be able to do it effectively. So we need a kind of a, you know, we, not an algorithm, but you need a way of thinking about the case. Now in the blue box there, those are those four metabolic priorities that I've talked about in other cases I've done uh, on other topics. The number one priority metabolically is autoimmune. Well, that's a possibility for her, although not really likely. What about red blood cell problem? I mean, possibly, but, you know, B12 and folate, that's really going to be under that because if you have a red blood cell problem where the red blood cells are too big or too small, if they're too big, pretty much the only things that are going to cause that is a B12 or folate problem. Now, the third priority, as it relates to Gwen's issue, is, you know, glucose or an HPA axis problem. Well, it sounds like, just based on her symptoms, that maybe that could be it, but we don't know yet. What about GI and liver? Well, that doesn't really have a whole lot of, of um, correlation of what her symptoms are thus far. So, we're just thinking about it in terms of two factors, right? Our metabolic possibilities and our kind of neuraxis brain possibilities. So how are we going to figure out what is what? So is she diabetic? Meaning is she kind of insulin resistant? Well, there's a couple different ways you can figure that out. One is, is she already diagnosed with it? Well, I'll just tell you, no, she was not coming in diagnosed as diabetic. Uh, could we test her fasting glucose? Sure. You know, for fasting glucose is high, that's not pathognomonic for diabetes, but it's a pretty good sign. What about her hemo excuse me, hemoglobin A1C? Definitely, we can certainly test that via blood. Uh, if her A1C comes back at 6.8 or 8 or something like that, real good chance she's diabetic, right? Pretty much got to be diabetic if your A1C is that high. Were there any symptoms, any kind of other symptoms, not her chief complaint symptoms, are there other associated symptoms she has that might tell us that she's insulin resistant? Sure. Here's the classic, classic symptom for someone with insulin resistance. About 30 minutes, give or take, after they eat, they get sleepy, tired, or drowsy. If you ask that in your intake packet, hey, does this happen to you? Or you ask it to the person during your encounter, and they say, yeah, I mean, 
I'm getting sleepy all the time when I eat. Now, I don't mean like two or three hours. I mean within that kind of 30 to 45 minute window, then that is a real good sign that they are insulin resistant. The physiology of that we can talk about some other time, but just for our purposes right now, that's a pretty good indicator that uh, she would be diabetic. Now, those other things, like the fasting glucose and A1C, we're going to have to test for those. So does she have a B12 problem? Well, we can check for that. We can just do a blood test and look at her B12 level. Now, true, the serum B12 test is not the, you know, it's super best indicator of someone's B12 status. I mean, it does have some technical problems. I mean, really, your methylmalonic acid is kind of your gold standard for B12 deficiency. But I'm going to tell you right now, when you're doing this kind of work, you don't necessarily live in the land of deficiency and excess. You're living in the land of more optimal, functional, physiological. There's a big difference between what the lab, just so you guys know, there's a big difference between what the lab range says is uh, high and low and normal and what the literature says is physiologically healthy and appropriate. Just for example, on B12, most labs to be B12 deficient, you've got to be somewhere around 298 or less. But the literature says if you're around 500 or less, you could probably benefit from B12. Now, I can just tell you from experience, lots of people with neuropathy have B12 levels that kind of suck. They're somewhere in that 300, sometimes, you know, maybe low 400s, and they benefit from B12. But the question really is, is not, hey, does she have B12 problem and not just give her B12, but why does she have that B12 problem? Why does she have that? That is where you take your care to the next step, and what I'll be teaching in the seminar is not just, oh, the B12 is low, give her B12, pat yourself on the back, see you later. No, you got to figure out why is there a B12 problem? And there's a little more, probably a little more detail to go into uh, today. But, you know, B people with low B12 uh, usually have some kind of malabsorption. And it could be from, you know, uh, kind of atrophy of the GI tract, atrophy of their stomach as they get older. Could be from uh, damage to the intestinal villi. There's a lot of things, but you got to track that down. Ultimately, you got to go as far as you can so that you serve them at the highest level. Now, does she have a folate problem? Again, we can check that via blood. And the good thing is, is serum folate is a pretty reliable indicator of someone's folate level. Now, it's not necessarily their red blood cell folate level, but, can, but folate is good. So if you see a folate of uh, four, you can rest assured that's probably how low their folate is. And if you see a folate of 18 or 19, that's probably what their folate is. But again, if we do a folate test on her and we find out that her folate is four, which is terrible, right? It's not usually lab low because usually most labs lab low for folates like three, but research is very clear. And from practical experience, I can tell you this. When you get around 10, that is not a healthy folate level for function. Usually there, that's a problem. If we find that she's got a folate of four, why does she have it? Well, I'll just tell you again, most of the time, it's a malabsorption problem. Uh, in this day and age, so many things are fortified with folate, it's sort of hard to become folate deficient unless you have some kind of genetic thing like an MTHFR or something related to that, or you're just not absorbing it. So the key always is, why do they have that? We don't want to do, I'll just, I'm going to get in a soapbox for just a second. A lot of people that claim to be functional, right, I'm a functional medicine doctor or something like that, all they mean is, is they run labs and they give supplements. You know, they're not really, and it's got to be high or low. They're not really functional. They're just, don't just give people medications. And I kind of have a little problem with that because really what you want to do if you're functional, if you're going to call yourself that is, you've got to know physiology and you got to be able to find out why is that folate low? Why is that B12 low? Because too many people say they're functional and all they're doing is saying they're running the B12, the B12 is low, I gave B12, I get a gold star, I'm functional. Not, I don't think so. I don't think so. So don't be that person. I'm going to train you not to be that kind of person, that kind of doctor. All right. So does she have an autoimmune neuropathy? How, how would we figure that out? To see what we're doing. We're going through our, our possibilities, right? We said, well, it could be B12, could be folate, you know, could be a glucose problem. How are we going to find out if it's autoimmune? Well, to really prove that someone's got an autoimmune problem, you're going to have to do specific antibody testing. Um, and antibody testing is expensive. There's just no way around it. You know, for this type of problem where you have a, a symmetrical, uh, you know, progressive sort of neuropathy, 
what are you going to check for? I mean, if you look down at the bottom there, kind of the fourth, fifth bullet, you can check for myelin basic protein, you know, mag and mog antibodies or silo-ganglioside antibodies, but I'm just going to tell you, and I'm kind of skipping over a bit, and I'm going to rule this out for us. She probably does not have an autoimmune neuropathy, basically based on the fact that her symptoms were so slow and progressive, the, the, the tempo of them. She probably doesn't have autoimmune. But if we were going to try to find out, you basically have a couple of choices. One is do specific antibody testing that might be relevant to that clinical picture. In her case, we'd be looking for kind of peripheral nerve protein antibodies. Um, or you can do this thing called a clinical challenge, and I'm not telling you how to do this right now, but you would give people uh, T helper 1 cytokine boosters and T helper 2 cytokine boosters and see how they react. And I'll explain kind of how to do that uh, in the seminar. Well, I'll explain how to do it. But you're not necessarily going to need to do it on everybody, but that's how we would kind of figure this part out. Now, often, and this is the most important part about this slide, I'll just treat them like they have an autoimmune problem. What does that mean? Well, I'll do a very, very effective anti-inflammatory autoimmune modulation protocol. I'll give myself about 30 days. And if that really makes a big difference in their symptoms, that's probably what the problem was. Now, that method, that thing down there in, in parentheses, is called ex Juvanti boost. I use it all the time because I could spend six or 700 bucks on antibody testing, have it take two or three weeks, or I could just treat them like they've got that and see what that does. So. Aside from that, she probably doesn't have an autoimmune problem. Just simply based on the symptom picture and the tempo and the history of the symptoms, it's probably not autoimmune. But I'll be explaining that in the seminar, how to determine that. We'll go through a lot of different cases where, I, where we can, you and I will look at the symptoms, look at the history, and be able to have a really good list of what is most probable and how to evaluate and find out if that's actually what's happening, and then how to treat it. You guys hear my phone going off in the background. So... Let's answer some questions. Is she actually, excuse me, does she have a metabolic problem? Well, she doesn't have any symptoms of insulin resistance. Like, you know, those symptoms I was saying, like getting sleepy after you eat? She doesn't have that. She's not already diagnosed with diabetes. And her most recent A1C that I didn't do, that somebody else had done, uh, was a 5.6. Now, is that high or low? It's pretty much normal. So, does she have diabetes? No. That's probably not what's causing the neuropathy. So the B12, the folate, the autoimmune question. Well, like I said, we could run blood tests. Uh, her B12 was 649. It, that's pretty good. You know, and her red blood cell markers didn't uh, conflict with that. Her folate level 16.3. Again, that's not something that's probably causing an issue. And again, I didn't do any specific antibody testing with her because I knew that it probably wasn't autoimmune. And so we're going to say it's not autoimmune. Now, one thing we did find is her, her most recent vitamin D level was 29. That's low. And do we care about that? Yeah, we care about that because vitamin D is anti-inflammatory. Is it the sole reason why she's having these symptoms? I mean, it's possible there is some literature on vitamin D and peripheral neuropathy. Um, we wouldn't know. We'd just have to treat her and find out. So that's kind of our metabolic uh, assessment. You know, what do we think about that? What do you guys think? And I'm asking you now, Freddie. What do you think is the probability of her? having a metabolic cause for her neuropathy. What do you think about that? I got to ask somebody, so I'm going to ask you. Yeah, so based off what you said, I would think it'd be lower, just because okay. she doesn't have the symptoms of insulin resistance. The And metabolically, other than the vitamin D, but even mm -hmm. then, I don't I don't see that too, too often. So I would just say lower for metabolic. Yeah, pretty low, right? So are we going to give her a metabolic treatment, probably? No, we have to keep looking to find out what the cause is. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I might give her vitamin D, you know, but I'm going to explain to her that her vitamin D needs to be better, but it's probably not what's causing her symptoms, right? So that's how you, I mean, that doesn't take that long. When you know what the probabilities are, you don't have to waste your time, you know, doing a bunch of other treatment that's not even necessary, right? So now we're going to combine that with the next thing, right? Which is, this thing will move. There we go. The, the, the physical and neuro examination. Now I'm going to tell you guys some things and you should, hopefully these things make some sense to you. And if they don't, come to the seminar. I'll, I'll explain why they do matter. So her feet are not discolored, meaning they're not blue, they're not red. Um, and that should tell you something. And I'll just go ahead and tell you what it tells you. What it tells you is there's probably not autonomic involvement in her feet because the perfusion of the feet seems to be pretty good. 
She doesn't have any trophic skin changes. Now, there are certain skin changes that are very common in people that have diabetic neuropathy. She doesn't have those. Skin looks pretty good. Now, could she still have some kind of nerve compression someplace? That's possible. How do we find out? Well, we did our orthopedic tests, all those kind of ridiculous looking for uh, you know, nerve root impingements and disc lesions. Those are all normal, uh, those provocative tests. Um, you know, doesn't appear to have any kind of peroneal entrapment around her fibular head. So we're kind of moving away from the peripheral nerve being compressed, right, bone on nerve. We're kind of getting away from that. In terms of her sensory function, right? Well, not to be, not too surprisingly, when you do her MSRs, uh, they're pretty sluggish at her patella and Achilles. You can elicit them, but they're not uh, brisk. Now, when you do vibration testing, you find that she's got a loss of vibration all the way up to her knee bilaterally. Now, which means she can feel the pressure of the tuning fork, but she really cannot feel the buzz. You go up around like her uh, trochanter on her femur, she can start to feel it, but that's a pretty wide territory of vibration loss. And something I'll tell you guys about vibration testing is I'm going to teach you a uh, much more efficient, standardized way to objectively measure vibration loss rather than just timing it. Uh, there's this kind of a tuning fork called a Rydell cipher tuning fork, which is a, a German uh, invention, and it works pretty well. There's some good studies on how when people just use a tuning fork, they way overestimate um, vibration loss. But when you do the right all cipher tuning fork, it's much more objective, and I'll teach you guys how to do that. She's got decreased two-point discrimination. When you try to have her lay on her back, you know, and close her eyes, and you touch her toes very lightly, she can't really tell which toe you're touching. And if you touch right and left at the same time, she can't really tell that you're touching both. So that tells us some stuff about her ability to kind of localize where these uh, body parts are. Now, by the way, her sensory testing in her upper extremity was totally normal. So it seems to be pretty much confined to her lower extremities. Now, doing more of the kind of the neurological uh, assessment, in Ronberg's position, she didn't have a, swall, but she, a fall, but she had excessive sway volume, and, and it was fast, okay, which means she's a fall risk with her eyes closed. One leg standing, you could guess, probably abnormal. Uh, and, there, and by the way, when you do a one-leg standing, there are age norms for that. And you guys really should know what those are. Like, she's 66 or 67. She's not supposed to be able to stand on her legs, uh, one-leg standing, someone who's 20. So you need to know those standards and apply them. Tandem gait was abnormal. You know, she's got the, the skipping foot. You know, she can't maintain it. When she just – basically, when you have her close her eyes, she's going to end up falling. Now, with the Fakuda test, that was abnormal. She kind of displaced and moved around. Uh, the heel to shin, like laying her down and have her take her heel and try to touch her kneecap, um, she missed that. She had a very difficult time finding it. So taking that into account, right, I'm talking to you now, Freddie. So if you take in those findings into account, what do you guys think is the probability of her having more of a brain-based lesion or some kind of integrative neuraxis lesion causing her symptoms? What do you think? Well, since you said the physical exam, well, none of the provocative tests, so we're kind of ruling out the physical aspect. But there does seem to be some sort of sensory concomitant going on, but I just find it fascinating that it's bilateral. That's the part that kind of gets me about this. Yeah, it's bilateral. So what do you know about bilateral representation? What's the part of the brain that has bilateral representation? I know that the right side parietal lobe does have. No, uh -huh. left side. No. Oh, oh my gosh, right. I'm having a brain fart. Is it, no, is it right. right? Which side, which side right has side the double? Bilateral representation. That's right. Exactly. All right, perfect. So I think we're moving away from metabolic stuff. We're like, it's probably not metabolic in terms of kind of the more neurologic. It's probably not peripheral. It's probably not cord. This may be up high, maybe more of a parietal problem. So let's see what we got. So here's what I did. Here's what I, here's the treatment I did. And by the way, this new system, again, is, is making all of my cool bullets and stuff not work the way I want them to. So I apologize for that. Um, what I did, I'm about to lose my mic. Give me a second, y'all. I did the following. Uh, this, is, this is a case from like 12 years ago. So I did oxygen via an O2 concentrator. Uh, and I'll ask you, Freddie. You can come back on the screen. Why, why would I give her oxygen? Because... Uh, well, why the oxygen? Hold on one second. So you didn't you didn't have the blue or red in the skin, so I didn't think vascular or autonomic. Right. 
Uh, maybe just, in, maybe just, uh, just, I mean, because the brain is dependent on fuel and oxygen. So you go, if it is a super segmental problem, if you give her oxygen, and if you see a change, then you know that you're making her central nervous system better, which could make her maybe regain some of her sensory feeling uh, in her feet. So it's, it's a good, good little test. Yeah, and, I just uh, gave it to her for fuel, you know? Right. Uh, I right. don't, I don't do this anymore at all with anybody, but back then I was kind of heavy into it. So I did it. Um, now the next thing is I used photo biomodulation to the plantar surface of both feet. Now, if you guys don't know what that is, basically that's the terminology that all the research is trying to get people to use when you're using light of any kind to be therapeutic, whether it's laser emitted or LED emitted photo biomodulation is the term people are using. So why would I do that? Why would I do that to the plantar surface of her feet? Because it will photo biomodulation you, but it literally put energy right into the area that you're targeting, which is kind of like right. the whole premise for photo biomodulation. So that's what makes it yeah, amazing. Exactly. So I was kind of hedging my bets a little bit, to be honest, because I kind of said, well, maybe it's not peripheral, but I did it anyway, right? Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm not writing a research study with patients, right? What I'm doing is I've got to, the lady's paying me. I got to get her, be, get her ready, uh, get her better as fast as I can. Right. So does it hurt me to do photo biomodulation on our feet? Not really. Right. I am giving energy as Freddie was talking about. If you guys don't know the physiology of that we'll talk uh, in the seminar about using photo biomodulation for neuropathies. But basically photo biomodulation is anti-inflammatory and it gives the, uh, the mitochondria a source of fuel to make ATP. Right. So that's basically the point. Now I had to do I had to do a seated you know, just sitting down, feet on the wobble board, doing dorsal flexion and plantar flexion. Why would I do that? Um, because you are literally stimulating mechanoreceptors in her lower extremities, which is for the target. You're basically, you know, the central nervous system is use it or lose it. And and her previous exam, she didn't, she had decreased awareness. So you're basically right. doing coordination mobility drills to afferentate that part of her brain. That's it. So if you guys at home, I, I'm afraid he's exactly right. Right. So that's exactly what we're doing. And it's easy. Like, I mean, she's just sitting there on the wobble board doing that for two or three minutes. You guys would be surprised how doing full range of motion of dorsal. That is a big input and it helps a lot of people, especially with these people who have neuropathies in their feet. Then, of course, I did vibration. What's that? I was going to say, especially I find that in aging populations when they, oh, yeah. when they start having less excursion of their joints. And but Absolutely. they start getting problems in those joints, and then you literally introduce movement back, and and their brain and literally distal extremities start waking up for lack of a better term for it. That's where my foot is. Like that's yeah. that's my ankle. Yeah. Um, we did vibration of both feet and the legs because why not? Because you know, we're afferentating the system. See, this is the part of the brain that see. This is the part of the body where the brain's having a hard time understanding where it is. Let's try to help it. Let's give some because these pathways, even though she doesn't sense vibration. It doesn't mean they're not intact. It just means the brain doesn't seem to be appreciating that. So let's do a bunch of things that we can try to wake the system up and see if we can just afferentate the brain. And then the last thing we use, we're targeting exercises with the feet. So what that means is she's sitting in a chair and you can do it very simply like this. They're barefooted and they have to, you give them a target and they have to literally use their foot to reach out and try to touch the target accurately. But they keep with eyes open, right? So they, so, so they touch, well, let me back up. So you give them the target, they look at it, they close their eyes, and they try to reach out with their big toe and touch it. If they miss, you hold the target where it is and you have them open their eyes so they can see how much they're off. Now, it's really important if you do this type of uh, little targeting exercise that they actually have to get, they have to stretch, you know, they have to stretch out there because that gets more parietal activation when you do it. And so what do you do? Well, you do both feet, you do high, low, you know, you do kind of, you just do a whole kind of field because you're trying to get them to realize and target and use parietal mechanisms, both visual and non, to try to coordinate where that limb and that body part is. Okay. So that's my little session of receptor-based treatment I did before. It would take about 20, 25 minutes to do that. Let's find out uh, if it did anything for her because <laughs> that's what's really important. So after the very first session I did with her, she said, and maybe this is placebo, who knows. She said, I a, she said I had, there's a lot less tingling and numbness and tightness right now. I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty good. Now, I'm not going to pat myself on the back too much because, again, maybe all that's placebo. I don't know. Now, after the third session, she came back and said she was able to sleep for the first 
sleep through the night for the first time in about six or seven months, which is very, very important. Now, after the eighth treatment, which was really, we did two times or twice a week for over four weeks, she says, look, I, I feel like this is like almost 100% better. I'm sleeping through the night. The pain and the paresthesias, I, mean, I get them just occasionally in like little blips. They're not sustained. And when I rechecked her vibration sense, she had her vibration sense was back. Okay, Those balance markers were better. They weren't perfect. Uh, and her sensory function had improved. So here's an example of a case where we looked at her symptoms and said, could be metabolic, could be kind of uh, you know, neuraxis brain-based. Did the investigation to see if it was metabolic. Didn't appear to be. Did the examination to see if it could be brain-based. Looked like it was. How do we know? We treated her. The treatment worked. So there's our answer. This was a uh, neuropathy that was not metabolic, even though she's older, even though you would have thought, oh, it must be diabetic. It wasn't diabetic. We ruled it out. So here's the takeaways just for Gwen's case. You need to know how to determine if the cause of the person's neuropathic symptoms are metabolic, neurochemical, or more strictly neuraxis based, meaning it's integrated. It's somewhere from the end organ all the way up to the cortex. You need to know what that person's symptoms are telling you about the possibilities. Because remember, in this case, what kind of ruled out that autoimmune stuff was just like the, the tempo and the history of the onset. It was slow, kind of it didn't happen acutely. It didn't happen after a sickness. It's probably not autoimmune. You need to know how you're going to evaluate if it is metabolic, right? So we said, well, it could be B12, could be folate, could be diabetic. We've got to know what tests do I do to do that and how do I interpret them? These are things I'll be teaching. And for the same, for the kind of neuraxis symptoms, same thing, right? You've got to know, okay, well, if it is parietal lobe, what test would tell me that it is? If it is a peripheral compression, what, how would I find that out? But then you got to also know how am I going to treat that? So if it was a B12 problem for her, how much B12 do I give her? How often does she take it? When do I retest? If it's, a, if it's a diabetic problem, how do I control her blood sugar? What do I do? What diet does she have? How do I retest? Right? For those non-metabolic issues, the kind of neuraxis brain-based stuff, again, how to treat those. So those are all the kind of, um, kind of the constellation of things that you need to bring to the table anytime you see a, neurop a neuropathy patient. Because if you do, you'll be able to get them better really a lot more quickly than you think. Uh, and they'll be very happy about it. Now, I have one other case, okay, one other case. This is Greg. Greg is also an older gentleman. He's 66. His chief complaint is low back pain. Now, I don't even see people for low back pain anymore, but back then I did. He works as a water plant manager, and he happened to have, happened to have had polio as a kid, so he's got kind of a little limp. So let me just ask you, Freddie. So this is the guy who comes in. This is chief complaints, right? Is there anything based on his chief complaint that tells you whether it could be metabolic more so than neuraxis or vice versa? Is there anything there that makes you lean one way or the other? Mm, well, uh, the polio kind of makes me, uh, and even then. Yeah. Uh, that's the red herring, though. That's a red herring. It, that's what I was about to say. I was like, I feel like that's there to throw me off the case. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, I, if I'm writing the AC and B exam, watch out for polio because I may put it on there just to distract you. I mean, honestly, there's not a lot there that says, oh, well, that may mean a metabolic problem or one of the metabolic priorities. There's nothing there that says, oh, that could be brain-based. Now, we could talk about, well, you know, people with low back pain often have poor representation in the brain. It's, I mean, you can go that way, but there's nothing really specific that's leaning you one way or the other. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to examine this guy because the symptoms don't really tell us anything. So we're going to have to examine him and see what, he, what we find. Now, in his physical exam, oh, guess what? This guy has loss of vibration sense up to his ankles bilaterally. <laughs> What's weird about this guy <laughs> is, you know, I'm doing that. And I was like, can you feel that? And he's like, no. He's like, well, I really don't feel my feet when I'm walking around. He's like, you don't feel your feet? It's like, no. He's like, you weren't going to tell me that in like your history or anything? Because he wasn't coming in for that, right? He was coming in for the low back pain. And he also happens to have on examination, he's got hair loss on like the lower seven inches of his leg down to his ankle, there is no hair. This is not a hairless dude. He's a fairly hairy guy. And it's just like, it's almost like somebody shaved him. It's like somebody just shaved a ring all the way down on both sides. This should be telling you something. And if it's not telling you something, it's going to now. 
But these are the little clues, the little breadcrumbs that should be pointing you in a direction. Now his skin is very, on his legs, is very bronze colored. It's very kind of brown and tan. And this is not a tan dude. He's just a, just a Caucasian guy. Um, his skin is waxy. You know what I mean by that? It's got that, it's got a real kind of, uh, it's waxy when I can think about it. And it's extremely flaky. This guy's skin is so flaky. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's like he's got body dandruff. You know what I mean? Like, I hate to be gross, but you, you can't imagine how much skin is flaking off of this guy. When he got up off the table, it was like there was a crime scene outline. You know what I mean? Like, it was just so many skin flakes. It was really, it was really visceral. That should all be telling us something. Now, I asked him some questions. I'm sitting there doing this, and I'm seeing all this stuff, and I said, Greg, let me ask you a question. You know, when you eat breakfast or lunch or dinner, I mean, how often do you get sleepy, like, you know, 30 minutes or so after you eat? And oh, man, I, I can't stay awake after lunch, man. I, I, I'm falling asleep at the desk. And Oh, really? Now, that should be telling us something. Freddie, what is all that stuff telling us? That should be pointing us all towards something. What do you think it is? Well... I mean, so we know that the sensory concomitant because of the vibration loss up to his ankles, again, bilateral, so potentially metabolic. We have the hair loss, so we know there's actual damage there. So you can literally see where the, where the damage is most on him, and you literally have a physical demarcation. Yep. Um, the skin points me towards autonomic as well. Mm -hmm. And then him getting sleepy, you're thinking, okay, autonomic. Mm -hmm. So... What mechanism? So what oh, mechanism? I'm sorry, this is meta metabolic, but I'm sorry. I meant to say metabolic into some of those scenarios. But so okay. I think right now I'm thinking more metabolic and there's some autonomic incompetence because of it as well, right. in, in my what, opinion. What, what metabolic thing is it most likely based on those trophic skin changes, right? What do you think? Uh, I, I, for this one, I think insulin, uh, insulin issues. Yeah, big time. Because look, He's got the physical signs that are associated with diabetic neuropathy, right? They <laughs> lose that autonomic, they lose the hair, their skin starts to get gross because they don't have good blood supply to it. The thing is, the dude does, doesn't feel his feet. Like, he's just not aware of his feet, right? And then he confirms with that, but when I ask him, hey, man, do you get sleepy? Oh, yeah, all the time. Okay, this guy probably has a metabolic cause for his neuropathy. I'm just going to tell you, that's probably what it is. Now, granted, he did not come in for that. He came in for the low back pain, but there's no way I'm letting this guy walk away. I said, Greg, you're diabetic. He said, no, I'm not. I said, trust me, you have to be diabetic. You ever been tested? No. I was like, well, I can guarantee you. I'm just going to, I don't usually do this, but I can guarantee you you're diabetic. I just don't see how you couldn't be, right? So anyway... There's the, there's the priorities, right? So metabolic priorities, this guy's got to have a blood sugar problem. I just can't imagine he doesn't have a blood sugar problem. Now, he didn't want to do any testing, though. That happens sometimes, right? Especially when dealing with a guy who came in for low back pain. You're telling me he has this glucose neuropathy problem. You know, he didn't come in for that. So I, I, you know, I understand that. But I just said, hey, man, try this. I gave him a formula that had chromium, vanadium, gymnema, and some other stuff in it. And it's basically designed to lower blood glucose. Now, how much do I give him? Well, the trick is this guy's having that postprandial sleepiness, right? You got to stop that because what's happening every time that's occurring, he's getting hyperglycemic and his body's converting that through lipogenesis into fat. And that consumes a ton of ATP, which is what's making him drowsy. You got to stop that process happening. So I said, take as much of this as you have to, so that you stop getting sleepy, tired, drowsy after you eat. I said that might be two capsules a meal, that might be eight capsules a meal. So Greg starts taking this. He comes in, comes back three days later, and I, I, I quote you. He says, "I'll never forget this." He says, "Hey, how fast is that stuff supposed to work?" I said, "Why?" Because I, I can feel my feet. I said, "Really?" Because yeah, I can feel my feet. And I re-examined him, and I kid you not, he had got his vibration sense back that he'd lost from, you know, from his toes up to his ankles that was all back and normal. Now, of course, his hair hadn't grown back, and his skin didn't look different, but those, that vibration loss came back within a few days of controlling those hyperglycemic postprandial spikes he was having. So I put that in there so you guys can see how sometimes the, 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 the clues are right there screaming at you that that's what this thing is. So again, just like with Gwen's case, you got to know how to determine what the cause is. 
what the symptoms are telling you about the probabilities and how do you evaluate and find out if that's what it is. But then lastly, and that's why I bold this with this guy, how are you going to effectively treat this? Because I could have given him a million things, but I knew that this guy's probably hyperglycemic. It's happening postprandially. Why don't we just get that to stop and see what happens? And that's what happened. Uh, within a couple of days of doing that, dude could feel his feet again, and just objectively, he got vibration sense back, which is very cool. Now, that guy got, kind of got lost to history because, you know, fixed his back problem. He didn't really care anymore. But that, I think that's a good il illustrated case of two different kinds of neuropathies. Um, Dr. Clark, yep. I, I'd be curious to see if you would have had maybe a different outcome in his lower back if you were never able to return his sensation to his lower extremities. Sure. Because every time you take a step, you're interacting with the world, right. so yeah. and you're dependent on that feedback, right? right. So exactly. you're, you're, you, have an, you had an opportunity to metabolically alter his neurobiomechanics Absolutely. You know, so yeah. so I, I love that multifactorial way of looking at your patients. So I thought this was really cool. I've done that a bunch. I mean, there's lost count of people who had different types of limb pain and back pain that just goes away. You know, when you do certain, when you correct certain types of metabolic problems. I think it was just a good good case to just kind of illustrate some of the. It's simple. You know, most both these cases are relatively simple in the realm of neuropathies, uh, except if you don't know how to determine if it's a metabolic neuropathy or not, then it's not simple. But once you know that, oh, pfft, probably not metabolic for that lady. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff that um, I'm going to be teaching at the class that we're doing in December. Um, it's going to be a three-day class. I'm going to be covering a whole gamut of the different kinds of neuropathy. So the, the immune-mediated neuropathies, the autonomic neuropathies, what type of testing should you be doing, and the physical side of things, right? How to do some of this rehab stuff with people. Because I can tell you, anytime you have a case with a metabolic neuropathy, every single one of them can benefit from some kind of receptor-based rehab. Every single one of them. The trick is knowing when to do it. Um, I mean, I would there's a long, long list of stuff that we'll be going over. But I, what I'm really excited about it is that you, after you take that class, you're going to kind of have like a little, <laughs> I keep saying like a little decoder ring, like a little a cheat sheet more or less in your brain of how to efficiently be able to differentially diagnose someone before you even see them. And then when you see them, be able to confirm uh, what you think it is, know what test to run, how to interpret them, and then how to treat them, both metabolically using supplementation, diet, but also the receptor-based rehab stuff that is specifically appropriate uh, for peripheral neuropathy. Now, what's really cool, um, I don't know, some of these bullets might be need to be updated, but, you know, there'll be a live training, there'll be some streaming that you really ought to come in person, to be honest, to get the hands-on stuff, because we are going to be doing hands-on uh, examination things. You get the flip classroom that's going to have a whole bunch of material in it. I'm just super excited about it. I think it's going to be really, really awesome. So um, when you're ready to register for that, I think that's the, the correct web address. Uh, Freddie, you have anything else you need to say about that? Uh, no. I think what um, – I'm excited about the program and, and specifically for this reason. When we, we started getting many requests for the last several years about a peripheral neuropathy class, we were we knew the direction we wanted to go into, and we picked you as a leader for this because we knew that you would have uh, the skill set in teaching in regards to the physical, the neurological, and the metabolic. Because we wanted to make it a one stop shop, right? right? Everybody has to kind of like this this single way of looking at uh, peripheral neuropathy. The first thing you think is metabolic, but it's like you know what? You also need to be able to do a proper physical examination. You also need to know how to do a proper neuro neurological examination. So we wanted to make cases, it like as, yeah, as these cases demonstrate. Right. So we wanted to make it like, hey, listen, you come here, you're going to have the understanding, you're going to have the skill set, and then know what to do from it. So the fact that you were chosen for this and the fact that we're, we were able to put this together and package it, that they can get this in a weekend and have the materials to review to get them proficient, should be very exciting to a lot of scholars. It's been highly requested. And uh, with the amount of uh, pop your, your increasingly large popularity in regards to your courses because they're so <laughs> applicable. I think people are going right. to be very happy with it. You're, you're a no-nonsense guy. You tell them what works, and people are pretty happy with that. I try to be. Uh, it, yeah, there's a lot, we'll be covering a lot of different modalities, not just simply you know the stuff I showed you guys. There's a lot of stuff you can use to affect the brain, both like using, you know, using laser and using other stuff. We'll be talking about that. It's going to be a lot of exciting. And if you guys want, and you can let Freddie know, we'll, I've got other of these cases we can do. I can walk you through some other stuff to kind of – show you how we go through this stuff. Anyway, uh, I know I got to run. You got to run. I Thanks for having me on again. It's a lot of fun to do these things. You guys let me know if you enjoy it, okay? Always a pleasure. Thank you very much, All Dr. Right. Clark. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. See you guys.